Mr. Gallows, thank you for doing this. How's your day going? Good, man. How are you? Great. Thank you very much. Am I getting you from the Immaculate Mansion in Georgia? <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. One of my few days home in the next two weeks. So I'm taking it in. Well, I do have some questions about that. But getting housekeeping out of the way, Rebellion, you have a big match coming up. Any different preparation for this match than any other match that you've had recently? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think that uh, we realized how serious Finn Juice has become uh, as a threat when we kind of let our guard down and uh, we end up losing the Impact Wrestling Tag Team title. Shame on us. Uh, but come Rebellion, it's a historical pay-per-view for Impact, and we will be walking out the Impact Wrestling Tag Team Champions. Our beautiful faction, the Elite, everybody's got championships, and uh, ours are missing, so... We got to complete that piece of the puzzle, and it's going to be the same old recipe when it comes to Finn Juice, a magic killer, a one, two, three, and a just too sweet. Wow. It's, it's almost like you've done that before. You're that good at it. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you joined the Impact Fold officially on paper about 10 months ago, and it was this yep. huge news. And I think most people were thinking like, okay, they'll come in, and then it'll die down. But you guys have gone to new heights in Impact did you know that was going to happen or are you pleasantly surprised? Uh, I think that we were comfortably confident that it would happen. Um, Machine Gun and I are always looking to prove something, and I feel like we always do. Uh, even when people may look at it like the chips are down, uh, I think we turned a negative into a huge positive. And uh, we've taken impact by storm and invaded another show in AEW reunited with some of our best buddies in the business. And I think we're making magic again. And, uh, I can tell you it's only going to get better from here. Yeah, that's a really good point. Mondays, we sometimes see you on BTE. We now see you Wednesdays on Dynamite, more of the time than not. Thursdays, we see you on Impact. Saturdays, uh, occasionally, we'll see a talking shop pay-per-view. Sundays, yep. we see you on Impact pay-per-views now that the pay-per-views have moved to Sundays, I believe. I have that. Yes. Rebellion's on a Sunday. Yeah. Every then, Sunday morning. Rock and Shop podcast drops with myself, Machine Gun, Carl Anderson, and Rocky Romero from New Japan. And Sunday nights now, uh, when the time is right, you have these impact pay-per-views. And I want to talk about that for a second, too, because yeah. we're coming up on Rebellion this Sunday. But it's, it's an awesome, awesome week to be an impact fan because it is Wrestle Week. Friday night, we have badass movie night with the Good Brothers. Uh, we will be watching Meatballs with all the fans on Access TV. Uh, there's all kinds of special programming all throughout the week on Access TV, so definitely check that out. Wrestle Week leading up to the big Rebellion pay-per-view. We got Mauro Ranallo coming in to call the cross-promotional world championship match between AEW world champion Kenny Omega and, of course, Impact Wrestling world champion Rich Swan. So it's just going to be a great night. So I hope everybody will join us on pay-per-view Sunday night. Now, with everything I just mentioned, that's not even 30% of all the stuff that you have going on that you do. <laughs> and something I'm super curious about with you, I, I've been listening to the podcast since day one. I ordered that awful pay-per-view that you did from Japan. Worst pay-per-view ever, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that set the bar very low. And so the two after that are just immaculate by comparison. But <laughs> were you this entrepreneurial 10 years ago? Because 10 years ago, we just knew, like, that's a wrestler – Seems like he's having a good time. And that's all we really knew about you. Uh, not necessarily, but I mean, it's funny because I got released in 2020 by WWE, but I was also released by WWE in 2010 the first time Yes, uh, at six years old. And I think that it had started then because uh, I wanted to go out and do things I hadn't done in wrestling before because I'd gone to WWE the first time so young. So I went all over the world, man, from, uh, booking and promoting wrestling in Africa, South America, uh, touring all over Europe on my own, going to Australia on my own, just going out there and doing stuff, going down to Puerto Rico and working for the Cologne family. So that was like wrestlers doing wrestler stuff and just really pushing it. But then, um, you know, over the years when I was in Japan and this last WWE run, the, the dawn of technology, social media, entrepreneurship, 
uh, in pro wrestling, but all the way across the board in entertainment, uh, it really took a step up. And I remember um, we got that call and everybody was was all down and so negative. And I was sitting in my sauna and I was like, no, this is a great chance to explode onto the scene and do all the stuff we've been wanting to do, but kind of been handcuffed and not allowed. So that day right then and there was when I decided we had to spoof all that and create our own parody wrestling pay-per-views and that it spun off into an alcohol brand and all the other stuff we're doing yeah. right now. So there's a lot going on, a lot more to come. We're working on a cartoon series right now. So uh, it's a good time to be a, a good brother, I would say. Not only the stuff you mentioned, but your own wrestling promotion, which definitely made headlines a couple of weeks ago when uh, Kaz, I don't know what you're allowed to call him when he appeared with all that. I think yep. there was once upon a time a tattoo parlor or a tattoo business you had. Do you still have that? I don't have the tattoo business anymore. Just uh, we're spread so thin with everything else going on right now that there's just no time to squeeze that in. But yeah, the Larry Auto Pro is... Uh, my home wrestling promotion. And you can see that on impact plus seven ninety nine dollars a month, every pay-per-view in impact wrestling history, lots of great content, including Kaz XL's return to pro wrestling at Larry auto. We just did a big aces and eights reunion show uh, at the end of March, two of them actually. So those are available on there with the lethal Larry auto match. So lots of fun stuff going on, but that app is definitely something you want to look into, especially for under eight bucks a month. Well, this is going to be a compliment if you're ready for one of those. But a lot of people, when they're working at the top of the card, yet they have all those business interests on the side. They're in terrible shape. Their work sucks. Not you. So you seem to be firing on all, all cylinders in the ring, in the business world and all that. Now, instead of just asking how you get it done, are you a big to-do list guy? Do you have people that you delegate things to? Is there a gallows team? Uh, well, thank you for the compliment, first of all. And uh, yeah, there is a team to a degree here because we had realized we were getting spread too thin, like between Talking Shop LLC and Rest America LLC and all my side ventures. Uh, so I do have a small team here. Uh, I got the great shoot Barbie doll wife who uh, helps out a lot with all that too, because it's a lot to manage. You know, we came off, we were in Texas on, uh, on Friday, we were in New York on Saturday, uh, home yesterday and then back out again tomorrow um, for AEW. And then that'll lead right into the rebellion weekend and some impact tapings and then headed out to the West coast to work on some stuff. I'm not allowed to talk about just yet, but Hey, it's just more fuel to the fire. So it's a good thing, but uh, yeah, you got to, uh, I, for example, right now, I'm supposed to be on a separate wrestling call, uh, a <laughs> Zoom call about another wrestling project, and I'm not on there because sometimes you're just not organized enough, but here we are. So. Well, then I'll give you three quick questions, and then you'll get that extra deal closed. And the first question... Uh, I gave you priority. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallo. So my wife and I were at the Legends of Wrestling event in City Field. We were amongst that group. Was that show okay. as fun as I think it was to be part of? It was insane. I think they ran me out there three different times and three yes. different for three different reasons. And I didn't know about more than one of them until after the show had started. But uh, the Nasty Boys put that together. Uh, Bill Goldberg, who's a friend of mine, uh, I had a blast being a part of that thing. Um, there's some funny stories that next time we have more time we can go into. But yeah, that thing was a blast. It does look weird when you have seven or eight thousand people in a stadium of that size but we did the best that we could with what we had at the time so it was a great show brian mars i have to ask him about that the next time i i speak with him uh second question uh, you have a country-esque theme song we've seen a friend of yours appear on different talking shop related things playing music who is that friend and did he do the current theme song for impact wrestling that you have uh, that is my buddy, Josh Morningstar. Um, no, he did not do the current theme song. He's a friend of mine. He's a singer songwriter, uh, writes a lot of songs for Cody Jenks, who I'm a fan and uh, friends with as well. But actually, The Devil Ain't in the Distance, I don't know if he's going to be mad that I told you this or not, but was written by the one and only Rocky Romero. Wow. OK, he's come a long yeah, way from the Hungy Vice. <laughs> yeah. He's talented. We just try not to tell anybody. <laughs> awesome. And my closing question, as somebody who has made it, by my definition of making it, any last words for the kids? Uh, don't take no for an answer. No is just another question. I saw this when I was eight years old and I was obsessed with it. And uh, 
here we are 29 years later, still rocking. So I've had a great time, got to see the world and uh, it's only just begun. So, and also watch rebellion this Sunday night on pay-per-view. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yep. Just keep it up. Thank you very much. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Outrocast. Can you hear me? Okay there. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see you. Good morning. Awesome. Good morning. Are you a morning person in general? Absolutely not. <laughs> when I had the pleasure of interviewing you back in July, you opened up a little bit about how you had to be a preschool teacher before you officially made it. And I was wondering how that works for a non-morning person. Oh, um, gosh, I, I guess I just got used to the schedule. Um, and I hated every minute of it, but I drank a lot of coffee when I got to school. Um, <laughs> I ate the snacks with the kids in the morning and then I was ready to go by the afternoon. <laughs> got it. Well, I have disrespected you because I haven't called you champ. I mean, isn't the law that I have, to, I call you champ first and foremost. Um, yes. And I, I appreciate that you corrected yourself because I've been shown a lot of disrespect lately on impact. So, um, I appreciate it. Well, good morning, champ. <laughs> and champ, you have a big match coming up very shortly. Rebellion against Tennille. Any different approach to that match than a normal match for you? Um, you know, I think my biggest gripe right now is like Tennille did not earn the number one contendership. She stole it. Yeah. Um, which if that was her strategy, I suppose props to her. Right. But, um, in the last few weeks, she hasn't really shown us, you know, uh, the woman that she claims she always was or that she claims to be, which is someone who um, kicked off the women's evolution, right? right. Um, so I expect, I hope that she brings that woman to rebellion, but I think that, you know, my strategy thus far has worked just fine. And I, I've held the knockout championship for, you know, 150 some odd days. So yeah. I'm doing something right. And if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah, you hearken to the thing I was going to ask next. Dominant, dominant competitor, your two reigns, you've held the championship more than anyone for the last year. That's really exciting. So when you came to Impact, did you know that it was for long-term arrangements or is it just, you know, a couple of shows and take it from there? Yeah, at first, um, and, and by my choice, it was kind of like, uh, you know, I know I'm coming in, uh, let's just do it you know, um, for short term and see how I feel because I came out of, you know, an NXT contract that I was not happy in. And I was very vocal about not being happy. And even before that, I came out of a ring of honor contract where I wasn't all that happy. So, um, I think for me, I was like, I really just want to feel this out and get my feet wet and see how, um, I like impact, see if this is a good fit for you guys and then move on from there. But those first tapings I was at last, uh, the end of last May, um, mm -hmm. immediately I was like, I feel comfortable. I, I feel fulfilled. Um, I'm excited about, you know, what I'm doing right now, but all of the possibilities that there are to work with other people. Um, and I just felt very welcomed and I felt like the environment um, was everything I was looking for. So uh, those first set of tapings kind of sealed the deal for me. And then from mm -hmm. there on out, I was like, whenever we're ready to make this permanent, um, I want to be here for the foreseeable future. Very good points right there. Now, to be frank, when you came in, it was, hey, here she is formerly of, you know, you were one of those. And then now I would have to say you were synonymous with being a world champion, with being an impact performer. So that's that's a wonderful thing when you can officially be yourself and not a formerly of kind of situation. Yeah. Not everybody gets to get to that level. So that's a compliment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, thank you. or, I, or like, <laughs> I didn't do enough in my former place to be formally, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I just kind of like tread, I, I did some things for sure, but I just kind of was treading water. So I think, um, you know, I impact was my eighth professional wrestling match ever. Um, and my whole career has kind of become full circle that if I get to be considered, you know, homegrown, um, impact talent, I, I am thrilled by that possibility. It's also a miracle that you don't have to have the letters FKA next to your name anywhere that you knew to use your name to begin with. Was that the genius advice of a trainer at the beginning or was that you just putting your foot down going, I am who I am? So actually the complete opposite. My trainer um, said, you know, you should think of a different name. Diana is, is kind of hard. Like if you don't know how to say it, people are going to say it. 
uh, wrong. And then, you know, you have all the double syllables or double um, letters in your last name. Yeah. So maybe come up with something different that everyone can pronounce. And I was, I just felt like, you know, this was 2012, 2013. Um, you know, Wikipedia is a thing and everyone's going to see that, you know, Brittany is not my real name. Um, and I don't like that. So for me, I just kind of was like, I'm going to stick with Diana and see how it works out. Um, and then, you know, I got to keep it when I was at Ring of Honor. And when I did transition to NXT, they did say, uh, what are some possibilities of, of other name options? And I kind of put my foot down of like, um, I'd really like to keep Diana because I do think that it's unique and you will not have another one. Um, but here's some last name possibilities that I'm willing to part with. Um, and nothing came of that email. So I just was Diana Prazo from there on out. And I love it because no one can take anything from me. Um, it's my name and all of my accomplishments up until this point are mine. And I don't have to have formally known as, or, um, you know, certain things we can't say on air elsewhere. Yeah. Well, another thing about you is you are on screen who you appear to be off screen, which is fantastic. You are this fighting person who no one would want to mess with. You don't deny that you're from New Jersey originally, nothing okay. like that. There was no pyro uh, at any point in your career, as far as I'm aware. So was it you that put your foot down and went, I don't want an entrance that I can't replicate on my own? Or is it just coincidence that it is what it is now? I think at the start of my career, I was definitely like shy and uncomfortable. And I didn't really know like what to do in an entrance that I was just kind of like, I'm here. <laughs> um, but I think now, you know, uh, everything that, you know, from my music to what I wear, um, it all embodies who I feel the virtuosa is and, and takes elements of who Deanna Perrazzo as a human is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, just standing there with your arms open and, and a smirk on your face is, is very much who I am. Um, but also just, just shows confidence and dominance. And, and that's the champion I am. Fair. Well, one of the exciting things about Rebellion, besides your match, of course, your match is the most exciting thing. Fact, we know that. But <laughs> it's that it includes talent from AEW and New Japan as well. Wrestling used to be the kind of thing where, well, if they're not in our company, they don't exist. We've never heard of them. Have you always had friends in all the companies at any given time? Like you're a, a well-networked, a tastefully networked kind of performer? I think I am, you know, um, you know, when I was with uh, Ring of Honor, I had friends that were in WWE. I had friends that were on the independent scene. And then, you know, when I went to, to WWE, AEW started. And obviously, you know, we know Britt Baker is one of my best friends. Um, and to see her be, you know, the first female signed there was amazing. I'm the type of person that thinks there's enough pie for everyone and everyone can succeed. And seeing my friends, uh, my friends thrive, um, means I'm thriving. So um, I've never been like, it's my company and only impact exists. Don't know. Um, I'm very much in tune to the entire world of wrestling. And that's what makes, you know, this partnership we have with AEW and New Japan so exciting because there's possibilities to see people like, you know, our, our uh, world tag team champions are, are Finn Juice. And I haven't seen David Finley since 2017 and we were in Japan. Um, so to see him come back, it's like, you know, I, I, I love to see my friends be successful. And I think this partnership allows everyone to, to be successful and to thrive off of each other's success. Have you always been that insightful to know that there's enough pie for everybody? I liked your metaphor. Other people have other ways of saying that same exact concept. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, as a young girl, I grew up wanting to be a wrestler. And at the time, um, you know, when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old, um, we were the popcorn matches and the brawn panty matches or the, or the, you know, mud match or whatever it is like that. I was kind of like, Oh, like the girls they're hiring aren't wrestlers. Like I want to see wrestlers. And I think that perception that I had, um, of, you know, we're hiring models and we're hiring, you know, bikini athletes. And I want to see a wrestler, um, jaded me a little bit when I first started wrestling, because I was kind of like, I'm a wrestler and, and, you know, this person shouldn't get opportunities, but as I've grown up as a human being, um, yeah. and as a woman and as a performer and an athlete in this business, um, I've kind of learned that there's enough room for everyone and there's a place for everyone and everyone brings their own uniqueness and experiences to the table. And, you know, you know, someone like Chelsea Green, who we laugh because she's my best friend in the whole entire world. Right. But she's like, 
Kelly Kelly is my favorite wrestler. Um, and for me, you know, growing up, it was like, you know, Chris Jericho is my favorite wrestler. Randy Orton is my favorite wrestler. Um, wrestlers. So I've been able to learn from these girls who at a young age, I was like, oh, they don't belong. Now everyone belongs and there's a spot for everyone and everyone's dream changes. Mine was to always be a professional wrestler, but that doesn't mean someone can't fall in love with it later on in life. Well, two quick questions, because you're the champion and everyone wants to speak to the champion today. What can I say? <laughs> the first one is, do you have a TV show recommendation you could pass along to someone who needs a new show to start watching? Oh, um, we just um, finished or we just started The Crown. Um, so it's about, you know, the royal family and, you know, um, King George's death. And, and we've just gotten past that all the way through um, to Princess Diana and stuff like that. So I just started it and I absolutely love it. Um, we also uh, love and just put on as reruns um, The Ranch with Ashton Kutcher. So those would be my suggestions. Two complete opposites. If you yeah. like history, go for The Crown, which I love. Um, but then also comedy and, and, you know, a good story is um, The Ranch. Good taste, not surprised. And the closer, <laughs> Champ, because this time I'm starting off correctly. Champ, yes. as somebody that I feel has made it, because, hey, you've been on weekly television for a long damn time now in a awesome, inspiring kind of way. My closing question is, any last words for the kids? Oh, you know, um, I am in college right now. And I think that for, for children, um, it's most important to stay in school. And that's kind of cliche, but um, I'm now an almost 27 year old woman trying to juggle a full-time job. We just bought a house and go to college. So it's a lot. And I wish that I would have stayed in school um, when I was 18 and started college and, and I would be done by now. So I think it's always to, to stay in school and find something you're passionate about um, and you want to continue to learn about um, and then have a backup plan because your, your, your first choice might not always work out. And by going to school, you're giving yourself endless possibilities. Wow. Inspiring. As always, thank you so much for your time, Deanna. Looking forward to your match. Just keep up the greatness there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Congratulations on this great fight that you had. What is still left to accomplish in your career? Because I believe you're eight years in since your first fight. My first step is to win this tournament and then whatever the life has for me. Thanks for having me, Scott. Congratulations on a wonderful event, uh, continuing a streak of wonderful events. Two-parter, and the first question is the Showtime partnership, everything going as planned. I'd imagine that everything is, but... Curious to hear more about that. And the second part is, how long are you planning to being at uh, Mohegan Sun for? Is this a long-term deal or something that goes month to month? I'll tell you, uh, we were here since July. So we've been here almost, you know, nine months, 10 months. Um, and we'll continue to be here, let's say, through midsummer. Uh, and as things open up around the world uh, and around the U.S., we're definitely going to get on the road and start promoting. But I do think that we, you'll see us here uh, at the Mohegan Sun with audience coming into uh, the hotel and coming into uh, the uh, arena here. So I believe that this by you know the second fight, maybe by Chris Cyborg's fight uh, against Leslie Smith, you might see some audience. It might be a small percentage of the venue capacity size, uh, but we're going to work with the um, – COVID task force from Viacom. We're going to work with the uh, the casino. We're going to work with the state and we're going to make sure that we do it uh, under the rules and regulations and guidance of everybody. But I do believe that in, by the end of May, you'll see us here with a uh, small audience as we can uh, move forward into, you know, the further months like, you know, June, July, August, uh, the, the capacity will grow. Um, and I do believe that, you know, by the end of the year, I think it's going to be full capacity everywhere, hopefully. And um, then we'll start we'll start traveling as soon as we can. And the Showtime partnership is going oh. as amazing as planned. Yeah. You know what? Uh, again, the, the what's great about this relationship is these are people I have already worked with in the past. And uh, it's like a reunion. It, it just like, you know, uh, 10 years later, it's just like a reunion. And. The same producer is there. The same uh, PR SVP is there. Steven was there. 
uh, when I had Strike Force and we had Gordon Hall and David Dinkins. I mean, it's 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 a lot of the same crew. So uh, it's like going back in, in time a little bit and uh, having a reunion with everybody. And I think that if you look at their storytelling, I think they do it better than anybody else. And honestly, those feature pieces that they built and that I've seen rolling out uh, on the broadcast are just phenomenal. And uh, they know how to tell a story and they know how to paint a picture. And I think that's uh, a great, a great addition for the Bellator production. As I've said to you before, long time fan. So I've got some irritating questions that that are on the, he's been listening to this guy for way too long. But before <laughs> I do all that, you're doing fine tonight? I feel good. How about you? Nonstop, but good. So congrats yeah. on getting, hi, my name is Johnny, the 25th anniversary edition out. How long was that in the works for? Um, last summer during the pandemic, I was busy because I was just trying to occupy myself and not go stir crazy and you know like everyone else I couldn't take my eyes off the news and it's just after a while it's just it's just maddening it, I mean not after a while I mean it's like immediately like maddening and stressful you know I mean you were there you remember last summer yeah so um I you know I, I made a record early in the year I, I ended up making a record that came out later in the year I did some videos and I, I uh, got a couple of uh artists I really like to do some remixes. Um, mm -hmm. And at one point I was like, I should release this on vinyl. Cause I, I always wanted to come out on vinyl. It was released in 1996 when sometimes records released on vinyl, but it was real rare back then. Yes. Um, and I don't know, it was just, you know, 20th anniversary and I thought it'd be fun to put it out. Yeah, it's one of those albums that I've listened to a lot of times, but I actually don't know much about it besides I like it. That's you singing and playing yeah. everything on it. But it's not one of those albums where there was like an oral history where all these people told the story about it yeah. and we knew what really happened. So can I ask you something? Yeah, no one was there. It was just me. <laughs> yeah, well, well, true. But uh there, there have been some amazing albums over the years that was pretty much one guy and the story of it actually did get out there. In your case, was the album a and r heavily? And by that, I mean, the label was giving you a lot of notes or did they just let you do it? You know, it's funny, man. Like I was 21. I was, oh wait, I was 20 when I met Rick Rubin. 21 when I signed and made the record and I was 22 when it came out. So I was really young. And obviously that was my first experience with the music industry and major labels. And, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago where there was everyone I knew was in a band. So like everyone, like there's a lot of people that got signed, especially in that era from Chicago, right yeah. after the Urge Overkill, Liz Fair, Pumpkins Boom. Um, so I capitalized, I, you know, I was like part of that, I guess, in retrospect. But um, so anyway, so I've, I've heard lots of stories, lots of horror stories from my friends with their record deals. And it's, it's sort of like you when you've never done anything before, you have no idea whether this is normal or like, like I just totally lucked out and hit a grand slam hooking up with someone like Rick Rubin, who is just an extraordinary person and an extraordinary businessman and artist and producer. And um, yeah, I mean, I sent them a couple cassettes. That's what we were doing back then. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, sounds great. Keep going. Excited to hear more. Outrocast.